Recently I came across an excellent tutorial by Christoph Dedeen for creating a Blender cell shader material, one that mimics the look of Studio Ghibli's Nausicaa. I thought it would be an interesting challenge to see if I could reproduce this shader setup using only Python and maybe make a few minor improvements. In this video I'll show you what I came up with and along the way we'll learn how to use Python to build shaders and node trees. In the video, Christoph starts by creating an icosphere and adding a subdivision modifier to it, so we'll do the same, but with Python, of course. We'll start in an empty general scene, split our view, and change one of the windows to a text editor, and then create a new file. As usual, we'll import the BPY library and then call the operator for creating an icosphere. Since we're using an operator to create the sphere, it doesn't return the Python object for the sphere, but it does select the sphere that it creates. So we'll assign our sphere object to a Python variable by calling the context active object instead. We also set smooth shading on the sphere by cycling through the sphere's polygons and setting their use smooth variable to true. Next we'll add a subdivision modifier to the sphere by calling the new function on its modifiers list and assigning it a name and type. Once we have the modifier, we'll increase its subdivision levels by setting its levels attribute to 3. We'll start by creating a variable to hold our material name. This can be whatever you want to call it. And then we'll call the new function on bpy.data.materials to create the material. Since we'll be using the node tree to link up our materials, we'll need to set the use nodes attribute to true. When working with nodes, there are a few Python objects in the material that we will use quite a lot. So we'll create a few variables here for convenience and to keep our code easier to read. One that references the material's overall node tree one which references the nodes themselves, and one that keeps track of the links between them. Lastly, we'll add the new material to the sphere's material list. If we run our code now, we should get a new sphere with our new material assigned to it. With our material set up, we're now ready to start building our nodes. But before that, we need to do a little bit of housekeeping. When we create a material, Blender adds two nodes to the node tree by default, a principled BSDF and a material output node. But of these two, we only need the material output node, which represents the final output of our shader. So we'll write some code to delete the BSDF node. To access the individual nodes in the node tree, we can refer to them by name in the node tree's dictionary. In this case, we'll assign the material output node to its own variable. For the principled BSDF node, we'll delete it by passing it into the node's remove function. Now we're ready to start creating the other nodes in our tree. For this, I referred to Christoph's final shader setup and went through and identified which nodes we needed and what their settings needed to be. We create new nodes by calling the new function on our nodes object with the type of node we want and assigning it to its own variable. Once we've created our node, we can set its attributes to match what Christoph did in his tutorial. For the most part, the attribute names match what you see on the node in the shader view. And although not strictly necessary, we'll set labels on the nodes, which will make them easier for the user to find in the shader view should they need to access them. From here, it's just a matter of creating and setting attributes for the nodes we need. In addition to our emission node, we'll need four mix nodes and five color ramps. Setting the values on the color ramp is slightly more involved since we need to set values on each marker in the slider. In the API, these are referred to as elements, with each element being identified by an index on the color ramp's color ramp .elements attribute. We can set the position and color on each element by setting those attributes on element 0 and element 1. Note that the color is a four item tuple which includes an alpha value. Next, we can add our image texture node by creating a node of the type shader node text image. In the tutorial, Christoph supplies a hatched pen image to use as a texture, which I'll include a link to in the description below, but you could use whatever image you want. We define a path to the texture node we downloaded, use the bpy.data.images.load to load that image and assign it to our node's image attribute. The only issue there is that by calling the load function here, we'd be creating another instance of the image in our file each time the script is run, which could end up creating a lot of unused data in our scene. So instead, we'll do a check in the scene's image data to make sure that it doesn't already exist in our scene. Since our image is more of a global thing, we'll add this bit up at the top of our code. We'll assign the path to our texture image to a variable, and then cycle through the bpy.data.images and check any existing image's file path attribute to see if it matches our file path. 
If it does find a match, we'll assign that to our image variable. Otherwise, we'll load the image into our scene using the bpy.data.imagesLoad command and pass it the path for our texture. Note that if you're on Windows, as I am, the file path contains backward slashes, which represent escape characters in Python. So in our texture path string, we have to include a double backslash to escape the escape character, as it were. For other OSs, you can probably just use a single forward slash. Once we have our image object, we can assign that image to our image texture node's image attribute, and we're done with the image node. From here, creating the rest of the nodes is just rinsing and repeating, creating the same nodes that Christoph uses in his tutorial, labeling and setting the values as needed. A couple of things to note. The mapping node scales attribute takes a three item tuple since it has three channels. Also, we can refer to a node's attribute by name as we do on our mix nodes, or by index as we do on our noise nodes. If we run the code at this point, we should get a big pile of nodes, and we can check that everything is getting created correctly. The nodes are not linked together yet, but linking them is pretty simple. To do this, we create new links between the nodes by calling the new function on our links object. The first argument is the attribute we are linking to, and the second argument is the attribute we are linking from. When referring to an attribute on the node, we access it via the node's inputs. You can access them by either an index number or by their name. For our purposes, we'll access them by name to keep things simple. After you have your nodes set up and run the script, we can now check the results. In our 3D view, we need to switch the display to rendered, and if we haven't made any typos, we should see the fruits of our labor. The only remaining thing we'd need to do to make our shader exactly like Kristoff's would be to arrange the nodes in the shader view to make them neater. Setting the node's position is very simple. It's just setting the position attribute on the node to a vector that represents the position. But rather than get into the weeds with positioning our nodes, we'll take Kristoff's shader one step further, and we'll gather up all the controls on the various nodes into one place for convenience. Since that gets a bit more complicated, I'll cover how to do it in part two of this tutorial. See you next time.